All right, welcome back to another episode of the Swan Dingo Files. Today, I have Alundis Havens here with me today. We're going to talk about is why he joined the military, what he did in the military. We're not going to hold it against him. He, had, he joined the Marines. He's so honorable, I promise. And then we're also going to talk about his transition out and how he's crushing business today. So welcome on, Alundis. My man, thank you so much for allowing me to come on, brother. It's been uh, some time, so I'm glad that we're finally able to connect. Yeah, I've heard a lot about you so far. So if you just want to uh, tell us, why did you join the military to be in? What led it to you, whether it was honorable or just you were stuck? Yeah, so for me, I was stuck. Uh, a couple things. My dad didn't make it too far in his Marine Corps career and I would lie about it. Uh, he got out on uh, medical um, they found out he's bipolar but it was one where like it's different the way you convey your story plus I couldn't say it to any other veteran because then they would be like you're not a fucking lie you know uh, that's what's cool about vets we we can feed out you know who are the good ones who are the bad ones whatever you know uh, so it was there my stepdad was an army guy it was funny he actually sent the army recruiter to my house army recruiters like you can be fucking AC Mac and I'm like nah I'm not doing that and I was like, I told you, I mean, they're doing grunt or I'm going supply. Uh, I ended up getting in a fight with my stepdad uh, because he was going on a tangent one day. He was racist. Uh, so he would just say off the wall fucking shit sometimes or go far on the right. And uh, for me, you know, uh, anything it was like if I try to dress a certain way and I didn't wasn't professional tone. Oh, now you're being ghetto. And it was just like going into it. So we ended up getting a fight one day, call my Marine Corps recruiter up. I actually signed like the day of my birthday, went to maps, everything. And then uh, I called up my recruiter after I graduated. I'm like, hey, man, I need to get out of here. So left three months early, uh, went to the Marine Corps. And that was kind of me escaping away from home, thinking that I was going to escape a lot of the problems that I had. But uh, yeah, that was just the, the eye opener for me. Yeah, that's not a whole lot different than mine. I got kicked out on my 18th birthday from my house and lived with my older brother for about six months. And then it was like, well, I got to do something. Uh, the big Maytag factory shut down. I couldn't even get a job at a donut shop anymore. So it's like, eh, here we go. So uh, what did you do in the uh, Marines? Yeah, so I was aviation guy, uh, aviation operations specialist, what they call it. So basically doing all the admin uh, for the Ospreys. So we had to calculate all the flight log books, do all that, make sure all the flight hours are good, uh, build the training plans for the whole entire year. So I had more of the operational side uh, for my job because I was just with overachievers the whole time. So I'll find more <laughs> dumb shit for you to do. Uh, so really like working with all the officers doing that mix. And then the second portion of my job was being in charge of uh, the training portion. So high weight, PFTs, oh, CFTs, all that junk, I was the guy to go to. Uh, problem was they figured out quick that I can adapt onto things, gave me more shit to do. And then I was 19, 20 years old, became operations chief, E6 position, uh, was just running my own unit for a year. So it definitely uh, was quick and a different kind of career for me. So what rank did you actually make it up to? What pay grade? Uh, I only got up to E4. So what happened was uh, this was year two. I was supposed to, I was on a promotion panel to pick up Sergeant. I actually was supposed to win it. All I had to do was go to corporal's course uh, the morning fucking before corporal's course the day before I was running PT. Someone stepped on my heel, knee bucked that out or tore some cartilage under my knee. And then here goes two hours or two more years of my career. Now I'm a shit bag because I got injured whatever. So uh, when I first got injured, was on a promotion panel. That shit got stripped away. My sergeant major lied to me multiple times on the politics behind it. Oh, you have to run a combat fitness test. You don't do that. You want to know why? Because the people in charge of the board were my fucking friends that were, you know, two levels up behind us uh, at the wing level. But it was something where like, that's where the politics come in. You know what I mean? If you're not the best looking Marine or mm. uh, even the back then, they were still tripping about the tattoos because the old tattoo policy. So I seen a lot of that shit. But um, that was where I first got injured. And then it kind of altered it. Uh, I didn't get promoted from there because right when I got to my four years, they put out that thing where you have to have four years time in service to pick up sergeant. So even if I would have got an uh, extension, and this is where I whittled it down in my last three weeks, uh, go to medical admin gives you a medical extension that doesn't make any fucking sense and then go to admin medical is supposed to give you the extension you know go back no and then i go to get promoted 
they text me, oh yeah, you're getting promoted. And they're like, Marine Corps changed it. You have to have four years time in service. Uh, I didn't have that on contract. So I would have to do an extension just to stay in. And then I could have got hit with malingering if I stayed in for my knee. That sounds like quite a, uh, quite a circus right there. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, uh, I made it up to you seven, but I pulled, I, you know, I did everything I needed to, but I saw a lot of people get passed over. Just, you know, my, even my wife, she was in uh basic training and uh, she tore her ACL during one of the runs and she never went to sit call or nothing. She tried to tough it out and then I'm just booting her. They're like, see ya. It's like, really? Like nothing. She tore her ACL in the military and you guys aren't going to let her do nothing. Nothing. No. So she ended up, I think she completed basic, but that was it. So yeah, military is definitely some weird stuff. What years did you serve? Recent, 16 to 20. So I'm just, uh, this year's my three years being out. Damn. Uh, I've been out six years coming up, so not too bad. So when you decided, or not decided, but when you knew you were getting out, how long did you start, pre or how long did you start looking at the transition process? Uh, so I was that one that had the backup plan my last year. I just knew I was going to get fucked over. Uh, the reason why it took me, okay. So injured my knee second year, it took me nine months to get to ortho and get the fucking referral. Cause they want to do this bullshit. We're going to give you this appointment and then refer you there and on. Right. So nine months, 12 months. Uh, so now my third year, they finally give me arthroscopic surgery. And then after that, they, uh, my, I guess the surgeon that I had was surgery happy. That's what they called him because they gave me a second opinion that I didn't want. Second opinion. Oh, we're going to do some injections in your knee. So uh, five injections later, we be down my last three weeks. And that's when I figured out. So good thing is I had the plan already. Uh, year two, I was already going to college. So had that in the bag, uh, thinking eventually I'm going to be a business owner, but really didn't have my shit figured out. I went into a straight fucking commission job before my VA money came in. So uh, talk about rough, brother, like one month making seven G's, two months not making anything definitely was difficult uh, with the wife. But that's where I kind of figured out my sense was the sales portion because uh, I was pitching my commanding officer about us flying these uh, training and readiness codes that I had no clue what they were talking about. But they're over here telling me, hey, you're going to go to the commanding officer. You're going to preach him about this flight schedule. And then you're going to talk about stop and goes and how we're going to be flying here and how we're going to be going on this jet. And they would fuck with me, like get me to talk about these things, thinking that I wouldn't do it. And then here goes me pitching it. So sales kind of allowed me to be able to step into something that I was familiar with, uh, but definitely was tough. As, as you know, brother, mm. uh, from our lingo and the way that we say good to go and Certain things like normal people do not catch that, and it's very difficult sometimes. No, it, it's I, I love the lingo in the military, but I'm trying to train myself to stop doing it. So it's just like God, but it's so tough. When I first got out, I was talking to my some of my family, and we get that perverted sense of humor too. And it's just like they just don't understand it, and it's just like. So I've retrained myself. You, you would think after six years, uh, I'd be okay. But now I'm sitting here talking to a bunch of veterans again. It's just like, hmm, are we gonna are we gonna break this habit or not? Or so, what uh, did you ever deploy or anything? Or yeah, so I deployed to Kuwait. Uh, I was out there about six and a half months. Um, that was when I was in E3. Uh, terrible time in Kuwait. My corporal in front of me. Uh, Great human being, but this was a fair a failure of leaders. Uh, his in, staff and CEO that he had before him didn't teach him jack shit about his job. So then another mm -hmm. one comes in, uh, great individual, terrible leader, uh, comes in and just made our lives a living hell. Cool for me because I learned how to be tactful. I learned how to speak, mm -hmm. but straight up tore my ass for an hour and a half. Woke me up early before a promotion panel on deployment after they were switching me from uh, days to nights. And she was just tearing me up. I was a bad NCO, never going to be good. And then and then allows me to go in the promotion panel, knowing that I was going to be a smart ass that I am. And uh, they asked me, like, hey, what would you do differently to get promoted? I said, nothing. I do everything to my utmost best ability, like we're supposed to do here. And uh, yeah, they all got a laugh out of that. So for me, it was 
uh, deployed out there and immediately came back. We had our month of leave. My unit moved to Hawaii. Uh, so the second portion of the career was building the unit from the ground up. Tough as shit, uh, especially when you have correspondent manuals, you have whatever, but there's not every single thing of your job is hashed in stone of what you do. So it's calling around to all over, you know, the whole Marine Corps trying to figure out answers to your job that no one could figure out. So when you were, when you were getting out, um, you kind of knew what you wanted to do already. You had an idea what path you wanted to take. How long did it take you to get something off the ground? So I took a week off, a uh, week off, went into that home improvement uh, sales, uh, tough as shit there. Um, at that time, me and my wife had a, we had a miscarriage while I was in the Marine Corps. And then that time, uh, while that happened, my grandfather died as well. So I was kind of already mentally checking out. Plus it's tough as shit when you're working 18 hours a day. Uh, we covered three and a half counties in Southern California. So I'm over here driving almost from San Diego, going by the border to LA sometimes in fucking trying to listen to audiobooks. And it's like, you can't get done. So wasn't able to start a family there. Um, wasn't able to do school work, which means no BAH. Uh, so we're going to be struggling. Gonna be struggling. So, yeah, that's where I started figuring it out. So went in from there, uh, mortgage brokerage. That was probably a good good decision because it taught me more about uh, inside sales and being quick on the phone. Fucking terrible for a veteran. Uh, why? Because there was another dude there, but like, dude was just wilding out partying all the time. So definitely when I'm trying to stop drinking, not a cool vet to be around, you know, because he's at a different point in his journey. And then there's me being married, trying to start a family and uh, arguing with these kids who are getting off mommy and daddy's couch. And I'm over here like, bro, I got my, I'm looking for my own house. We're doing all these things. Uh, I need to take care of my body because my knees, my back are shot, hips are shot, like going through this every single day, you know? So realizing that that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, took another <laughs> four months or six months Worked at this other company helping vets, but realized that they were in it for the financial game um, versus actually helping vets. So that's something where it kind of pissed me off. Plus, like I was telling you before we recorded, um, they, my nanny moved to Minnesota. So I'm making sales calls, with my daughter in my arm, and they made it a big deal. Uh, Is your heart here was the first thing that came to instead of me telling, saying that, hey, I was working 688 hours. I'm already your number one, number two sales uh, closer a month. Like there was nothing to worry about. You know, I quit. My numbers skyrocketed up after because I had a bunch of deals that were in the pipe that I was closing. Uh, so I was like, all right, you know what I mean? Quit that job and then just went into podcasting and figured out from there that, hey, you know, what really resonates with me is talking about the difficult shit or talking about how, you know what, we didn't engage in combat, but we did see some shit because that's something that you hear, you know, as vets. Oh, we didn't go out there, but that like doesn't make any sense because I volunteered at a fucking concert and I seen five people OD there. And that was something where they were like, oh, you're just a corporal. You're in charge of all these people. And it was just like, yeah, you know, the amount of shit that happened there, a crowd fight. Like I thought it was all normal. So I didn't think about it. But those are the things where in my podcast, I started really talking about recalibrating that mindset, uh, talking about, you know, growing up back home, how it was tough in the household, how my stepdad had conflicting views. Uh, so it allowed me to start, you know, acting crazier when I got older or uh, going through my process. It's like you didn't get to learn about a portion of yourself. So really figuring that out so we can be the best men we can for our, our spouses uh, and children. Excuse me. So you said you mentioned something about alcohol. Um, do you drink now or did you drink before? Yeah, I used to drink a uh, gallon of whiskey a night. Um, we were raging when I was in the wall. Yeah, so Marine Corps was raging. Uh, you see a lot of shit. You're treated like fucking shit. So definitely was something where uh, I believed, you know, we should have preached more on the side of helping each other, you know, manage the stress. Uh, but that's not the way they, they handle it. Or a lot of times, you know, they they act like everything's on fire. The world's going to end and it's the smallest problem, you know, but you can't go home until you do this. Furthermore, we're there till 18, 1930. And then now we don't eat dinner. Mm -hmm. and morale goes down for the more we're drinking. So that was one thing for me. Uh, also, throughout this time, boot leave. Uh, my stepdad almost shot my wrestling coach. So that was something. The that fuck? Was yeah. Okay. So we had a party. Uh, to sum it up, only one bathroom. My wrestling coach came up to me. Hey, 
I'm going to go to the bathroom. My mom's over there. So my stepdad thinks my mom's having an affair, shoots a 45 a centimeter from the coach's face, SWAT team comes through. Uh, so it was something for me that like I kind of pushed to the back of my mind, but did what a lot of fucking vets do and sent money home to my mom and got burned my first year. And then uh, throughout that time as well, one of my cousins got stabbed seven times. So it kind of was, it was cool to me because I was like, this dude was uh, strung out on meth in high school, used to send my my own people against me to try to jump me because of his shit. Uh, so I was glad, you know, it's like, hey, I know you get away from home, but you still got to deal with all this shit. And in that time frame, I had a couple of friends, uh, five friends total now that died. So it kind of was something that just kept messing with me because I was just like, oh, my friends from high school. And then uh, one of my buddies used to party within the Marine Corps, took his life. So it was something where like that drinking problem came deep from those childhood wounds, uh, not processing trauma, and then uh, see my own guys, you know what I mean, dealing with their shit, but we don't know how to talk about it as men. So if wow. we can make ourselves feel better now, you know, we don't think about later on. And that's that's part of the sadness. So how did you overcome your drinking? I mean, I know it was childhood and, you know, teen trauma. And then I, I know for a fact, because I have my own, that the military really does push it on you more and unintentionally of course mm -hmm. but they don't realize that what the stressors they put on us that makes us want to drink more um i don't know if you know or not but my brother-in-law he passed away about two years ago from alcohol me and him served together 2003 four in iraq and then came home and we we're roommates out of fort riley mm -hmm. and you know we tried to get him to help we tried to get him into the va and because he didn't want to self-admit there was nothing we could do. And then eventually he died. Um, and, you know, being he, my wife is Navajo and, you know, Native Americans already at a disadvantage for alcohol. And he just, fi finally, he just ended up going. So how did you overcome the alcohol then? Uh, that was tough. Uh, made a lot of bad decisions. Um, I didn't really realize I had a prop as always, you know what I mean? You don't think you have a problem until it's too late. Uh, so for me, it would be like just being drunk all the time, showing up faded around family. Well, family I fight with and I don't get along with. So showing up faded there, um, my wife's family, uh, the first time I met my father-in-law, I'm over here drinking at their house and I don't really get along with my sister-in-law. I talk a lot of shit to her. She just one of those people annoys me. Uh, so I'm over here yelling at her, shut the fuck up. And just being an asshole, you know, so my father-in-law checks me and I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, but really just going through my stuff. So for me, I uh, was getting into a point that it no longer served me. I started getting out the military. Uh, my wife got back from boot camp in the Navy. Uh, I really wasn't drinking as much because I was blacking out, acting crazy. And then uh, my grandfather died and I really was just on this journey then. Um, where I started getting into cannabis and figuring out, hey, how to meditate. So throughout that time, it was deep because it was a lot of crying, uh, kind of releasing some of that pain, you know, talking about it, uh, just giving myself time to be able to heal, write down, journal everything out. So the more that I kept like going in on that, it allowed me to be able to touch on, you know, those things about life. And then at the same time, you know, be able to talk about the difficult shit um, that I like suppressed in the back of my mind. Like one of my favorite Marines, uh, was blacked out one night trying to kill himself. And it was like, I never wanted to talk about that because that's something we don't do. Or one of my guys before deployment thought he's fucking hilarious, had a hard hat on, tried to jump off the third deck or fucking catching him laughing. And it's like, when are we going to say this dude trying to kill himself? You know, we thought it was funny because uh, he's just being a clown, you know? And it was just like these dumb instances that I finally was able to process and allow myself to be like, hey, you did go through things or, you know, a lot of the suppression, not thinking about it. Uh, hit me at that time so it allowed me to start reaching into that and then to sharing it you know with people helped me out as well because uh, then I was able to be like hey you know alcohol I make very dumb decisions I start you know acting crazy you either get older mm -hmm. or slicker the way we're talking and it's just like hey man that's not my angle you know that doesn't resonate with who I am uh, how to relearn who I am you know once you stop drinking because then you realize like all this shit you thought was fun and funny is not funny and, and fun anymore. You're like, bro, this, this shit's boring. I don't want to go out. Uh, so really you have to figure out, you know, what's important to you. Yeah. I'm going to have to take a lesson from you one day, but it's not, I need to stop the alcohol too. And, you know, I got six kids and everything. And this is why I started this journey. 
and it, it's about time for me. I don't want my kids to drink, and of course they're half uh, native, so they're already at a disadvantage. At least I guess partially. I don't know how all that works exactly. So, but we'll, I'll get there though. I, I told you know I've told a few people this. Is, I'm having a lot of fun doing this, and doing this keeps me pre preoccupied. And I keep telling Trey the same thing. It's like, man, keep me preoccupied, and I'm good to go. So I like I like work and. It keeps me going and you know six kids to build an empire for you want to buy one by the way hell you yeah, man i got my, i'm on my second one next month so i'm over here trying to figure out my gig and, and that's the best part now you know is uh being present for things mm -hmm. uh i take care of my daughter while i'm building a business and work on podcasts uh and do podcasts every day so it's cool managing it through and figuring it out you know and with the second one i know it's going to be tough mm -hmm. trying to get both not to be screaming but uh, I'm ready for that challenge, you know? So it's something where now that's where like the, I know you mentioned that, you know, when you're, you keep yourself accountable, you talk to people, but at the same time, and I know you can account for this brother, like in order for us to be the best version of ourselves, or even putting fucking work, you have to wake up early. You're either staying up late or doing the shit we don't want to do or cleaning up like all the things that go into it. Like, bro, I don't even want to drink anymore. I don't even like staying up late anymore because it's like, fuck, dude, kid wakes up in the middle of the night. And then I'm like, I don't want to get up. My wife's like, I'm, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, fuck, I got to get up. You know what I mean? So it's like all these little things. I'm kind of glad now that I was able to slow down. Uh, I haven't drank in a whole year. It was a sip last year, uh, which was something I was kind of angry at. I yelled at my my mother-in-law for it. She was trying to get me to taste some punch she made. And I was just like, hey, you know, that's something I don't want to do. Uh, cause as a dad, it's fucking difficult as shit to wake up in the night, wake up early in the morning. Uh, I make myself work out at three or four in the morning. That is not something I want to be doing. My body feels like complete shit. You know, my joints are always aching, but it's something that allows me to be able to, to really separate myself sometimes and get me to realize that, yeah, you know, we got to do the hard shit we don't want to do. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you completely. It's definitely, um, with the kids trying to wake up in the middle of the night that fog you have in your brain it's just it does not work but i'll give you a little bit of advice stop at two stop at two kids anything past that it just gets harder and harder and harder and you start deviating your time between multiple kids and you you for you don't forget but you kind of start slacking on the attention that's needed for children at a young age and you've already been through a rough life as a, as a child you ain't gonna want that for your children you're gonna to want to be there every step of the way and being a previous vet you know what you need to do to make sure your kids are successful so and you're on that right path we're all on that right path that i've talked to you so far but if there's one thing you could have learned you if there's one thing you could have known before you got out when during your transition that you might have done differently or wish you would have known what would it be Ooh, I'm going to say stop worrying about other people's opinions. Uh, nice that's, one. That's yeah, man. It's tough as shit. You know what I mean? Why? Because uh, I found myself sitting in college classes. I got a business management bachelor's degree um, and it taught me how to be a supervisor, how to be able to run the business essentially and all these different functions. Right. But what I found myself was like writing argumentative papers that I 100 percent didn't agree on. And they're trying to talk about, you know, oh, if you're you know, the politics and da -da. it's like, no, I'm not, you know, so I'm getting in trouble for being fucking practical when they're like, hey, this guy messes up here. What's the corrective action? I'm like, I'm not going to counsel him every single time. I'm going to talk to them as a fucking human being. I'm going to understand as a leader the way I need to communicate. And I'm going to ask them, hey, man, you know, what are we missing? And I'm going to keep walking with them. Why? Because I've had the leadership that told me, hey, you're a fucking idiot screaming, whatever. Like that doesn't work on every single person. So it was like writing those college papers didn't understand it there. Uh, listening to my fucking family that are like, oh, if you don't do anything with your military service and have a job where you can work at the airlines, you don't mean anything. And it's just like, hey man, like, what does that mean? You know what I mean? I got my own job. I got a degree. I got a house. I have a family I provide for. Like, if you listen to all these other people, you're never going to figure out what you want to do. Even to where I started my own podcast and it was like getting deep into my own shit, talking about it. And again, you know, if I would have just kept listening to other people, looking for their approval, uh, then it wouldn't allow me to start the business. I would have kept having those doubts. But the difference was, was I was just like, man, 
I already did that. You know, I already worked somewhere, got injured, realized that, oh, you know, they're talking about me being a shit bag, me not being good enough because I'm not healthy when I'm like, bro, I'm running this stuff. I'm teaching all your guys. I'm teaching everybody how to act appropriately, how to win hearts and minds. And it's something where it was like, you know, you can't keep doing that. So if you can figure out your own page, what works for you, where you want to be, what you want to do, it may suck, you know, it may take time to rebuild, but definitely well worth it. Oh, that is good to hear. So it is, I think a lot of, a lot of people need to hear that. Don't worry about what other people think. I think that's, you know, everybody talks about other people's opinions. They're, you know, they think they're making an ass of themselves and it's like, who cares? I mean, you just shoot your shot and get out there. And I mean, if you fail, pick yourself back up and go, no one cares. It's like, we're all human. So don't worry about what other people think. It's it's nice to hear every once in a while. So this is going to wrap this up. Do you got any questions of me? My man, you, you, you've been amazing, brother. So for you, uh, I would say, what was the transition like for you when you were getting out and then realizing that you can convert some of those skills over? Because I know for me, that was something that was tough where uh, the trying to convert what I did to the civilian sector was tough as nails trying to be able to translate some of those skills. Oh, so when I transitioned out, I, I'm medically retired um, after 14 and a half years of you know, army service. I was in E7. I thought it, I pretty much had it made. And then I was told, Hey, I work to me for a medical retirement. It's like crap. I had three kids at the time. Wife was pregnant. Not easy, but I knew I was going to get money from the VA. I got 90% disability rating. So I get money from the VA, but it's like, I'm one of those people that's never happy unless I have more. So I went through the transition thing, the program that the Army has, which I'm sure it's the same for every branch for the most part. It gives a lot of false sense, sense of security, doesn't properly teach you how to write a resume, all this other stuff. Um, it's really just, it, it was just like filled your head like, oh, I'm going to do this great stuff on the outside. One thing I always try to preach to my soldiers was make yourself marketable in the outside world. The problem with that is I never did it for myself. So when I got out, I moved back up to Illinois. Instantly, June seventh, I I got my papers. June eleventh, I walked into the DMV in Illinois, took a CDL test. Didn't take the driving test because I had a piece of paper from my um, commander. So they gave me my CDL license, no driving experience for the semi whatever. And I, now I've been doing that for several years, but I started doing this with Trey, this journey of this PR and podcasting and stuff like that. And it's kind of helped me with my mental health. Um, I did a lot of things while I was in, I tried to go into the VA. I've tried to get help from other, you know, outside entities. And it's just like, nobody understands me. Nobody understands what we went through because majority of people were, were not in. So doing this podcast is a lot of help. It's actually allowed me to talk to veterans again, which I never thought I would do. Honestly, I never thought I would do this. And I'm actually enjoying this because I'm hearing their stories and some of their struggles and how they overcame it. <laughs> Excuse me. And now it's just like, I'm actually having fun doing this because I'm hearing how other people do it and what they over overcame. And now we're sharing stories like what you're supposed to be doing instead of just holding it inside. I've tried to kill myself a few times. So, and I even tried to, I even deployed and tried to kill myself or have myself killed that way. Didn't work out. It wasn't like a trying. It's just they suck at shooting. So that's why I just tell people. But my biggest thing out of transition was, man, if you start setting yourself up early, you can really get yourself on the right track, start networking, start finding the people you want to surround yourself with years before you get out of the military. Don't just surround yourself with military people because they're not going to be there forever. They're going to go to their end of the country or some even another country and live. They're not going to be there for you. So forever. Start ne networking with people that you know that are smart, that are business leaders, that are, can very easily show you something. And don't pay for one of these programs on the outside, these coaching programs. There's people out there willing to do it for free. Don't do it. Don't pay for no marketing program. Don't pay for no coaching program. Don't pay for none of it. Figure it out yourself. 
surround yourself with the right people and you will become successful. Not overnight. It's going to take time. It's going to take dedication, but you will, it will happen. So that's my little take of it. I had fun though in the military. It was a blast. Um, I miss it, but I don't miss the running part. And thank God I wasn't a Marine because I would have never been able to run, was it three miles for your damn PT test or whatever you guys call it? Screw that crap. Yeah. Through, that that's where I was at, bro. Once I got hurt, they were like, "Oh, you got to do three of them." I was like, "Nah, I'm not. Like, it's not happening." But I definitely love how you mentioned the resume portion. That was something I freaked out about, and then mm -hmm. kind of ran into, especially like you can translate some of the things you do, but if it's talking about KPIs and I'm trying to go into sales, like obviously my job isn't measuring KPIs. So you can make something up, but it's not going to be legit if you can't show it, you know? And that was like something I wanted to answer it on the resume, but they couldn't cover it. They were like, oh, you're going to college. You're fine. I'm like, what? Like, this doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? No, I, I was a cavalry scout in the army, reconnaissance, surveillance, and security. I didn't want to be a cop. I would feel like a hypocrite because I do speed. I don't stop at stop signs all the time. It's like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. So, and I didn't really want to be carrying a gun anymore on my, you know, on me all the time anymore. I need to get away from that lifestyle that completely. So it's like, uh, my, not much out there really. My, a Calvary Scout's good for on the outside. So it's like, well, and I, I have, you know, two years worth of college through Grand Canyon University out of Arizona. I just, I just hate going to school. It's just, I don't, I don't know. So, but I'm glad I started this. I'm glad I found the group I'm finding now because what I love about veterans is that we all lean in on each other one way or another, and we're willing to give advice for free. So, and that's what I really like is, you know, we're always there for, we're always there to lend a helping hand or at least steer each other in the right direction if you find the right ones. So, but that's going to wrap this one up today. Uh, Next episode of Swan Dingle's file is complete. Alundis Havens, prior Marine, crushing on the outside. And one day I will be working with him.